Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome. My name is Jude Blanchett of CSIS. I'm really delighted to be hosting this discussion of Chun Han Wang's fantastic recent book, The Party of One, The Rise of Xi Jinping and China Power's Superpower Future, which was published this May. Chun Han, who I'm sure most viewers already know, is a China reporter at the Wall Street Journal who has been covering Chinese politics, policy, foreign policy for, for a long time and is certainly one of the best analysts of our contemporary China and, and Xi Jinping. But we're also delighted to have two of the additional best observers of Chinese politics and decision-making. We've got Neil Thomas, who's a fellow for Chinese politics at the Asia Society Policy Institute's Center for China Analysis, and Sheena Greitens, who's a visiting associate professor of research in Indo-Pacific security at the U.S. Army War College. Uh, we're going to get right into it, but just a very brief uh, format for today. I'll, I'll start out by asking Chun Han a few questions uh, about the book. Um, and then we'll dive right into uh, a discussion with the entire group, both of some of the conclusions that Chun Han has reached in the book and why those matter. But we also want to get into some of the burning questions that I think are on the minds of many right now as we watch this rapidly evolving or, or devolving, I guess, political system in China. Questions about <clears throat> the, the the death of uh, former Premier Li Keqiang and what, what that means for um, uh, what that means for Xi Jinping is this something that could open up the gates of of dissent? We'll uh, I'll ask the group about how strong or weak they think Xi's Xi Jinping's current position in, in power is, and how would we know? Um, and then we'll also look a bit into the murky future to try to um, gauge what's what's next for um, China's political system and, and and Xi Jinping. So, thanks to everyone for joining this. Um, and with that, we'll get right into it. And Chun Han, firstly, um, huge congratulations on this. I know this was um, a, a lot of work. Um, also came out at a perfect timing for those, I think everyone just increasingly confused about what's happening in China's political system. Where, where is it going? What sort of leader is Xi Jinping? I think we're, we're now well into the third act of Xi's time and power with lots of really critical questions and your book is, I think, the, the best place to go to try to begin to wrestle with these. As a first question, I, I wanted to ask you just when you were first, um, you know, putting notes down to, to begin the work on a proposal for this book, what were the puzzles or challenges or, or, or sort of questions you had about Xi, the way his power worked, how his leadership worked, that motivated you to want to spend a few years researching this? What, what was gnawing at you um, in those early days? Mm -hmm. So um, thanks for uh, having me on the show and appreciate the kind words you have for the book. Um, in terms of what was, you know, interesting me, uh, interested me in terms of researching Xi Jinping for this book, I think um, a lot of it was um, about how you know, the mechanics of his power, you know, how do you accumulate it? How do you enforce it? How do you enforce his authority over the party? You know, what does he want to do with this power and how effective he has been in using this power? Um, and I'm also also interested in how like that, this particular system that Xi Jinping has built around himself, this highly concentrated, highly centralized uh, hierarchy, how does that, you know, affect people in the rank and file? You know, I was interested in how, you know, the everyday bureaucrats, local officials, how they survive, how they function in the Xi era, you know, where they are, they are under central leadership that expends far greater energy than before in policing their behavior and sort of enforcing what they see to be exemplary conduct. Um, and I think in the course of this book, I actually, you know, I was, I was fortunate enough to be able to do some of my reporting and research for the book in in my day job uh, for the Wall Street Journal. While the you know the, the, in terms of this 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 issue I was talking about just now, I was able to write a front page story for the journal where I sort of explore this topic of uh, formalism and bureaucratism, um, which is one way this you know the Xi Jinping era sort of manifests itself in this very perverse way. You know, we had officials trying to cope with the high pressure governance that she exerts on them. So they resort to doing very weird things in response to very weird incentives, you know, that's been exerted on them. So, you know, I had a lot of fun anecdotes in that story describing how local officials would perform political red rituals 
or even commit outright fraud um, to feign compliance with she's very broad and sometimes conflicting demands. So I think I was very interested in, in trying to tease out, you know, some of these implications of she's approach to governance. And obviously the other, you know, the book, if you've read it already, it covers a lot wide span of topics, you know, from diplomacy to history to national unity. But I think initially when I thought about writing this book, I, I really wanted to come to grips with like, how does the party function under Xi Jinping? I'm curious along the way, as you were working on this, what is a what is a preconceived notion or or a prior assumption you had about either the political system or Xi Jinping that was overturned or significantly modified by the time you, you know, clicked save on the final draft? Mm -hmm. Actually, to be honest, I wasn't there wasn't anything I really changed my mind about or was surprised by because I think. The, the process of researching for this book was sort of this iterative process where like I'm sort of building on incremental gains done you know both by the journal, me and my colleagues, our research, our reporting, and also the work of other people, you know, and other analysts like yourself and Neil and Sheena. So it's not like there was like some eureka moment where you discover something that really changed your mind about what's going on. It's more about incremental knowledge gains that you know sort of help you refine your understanding of how she operates, how the party operates under him. So I don't think there was anything in particular that really struck me as like, oh, wow, I never knew this. And therefore, I'm you know, doing a 180 of my understanding of how she operates. But I think it's more in a case of we learn a bit more. OK, we have a better understanding of how he approaches certain issues, how he thinks about certain issues. So I think that that was how I, you know, in terms of my thinking on she, how it, it, it was more like evolution rather than a sudden or like revelation. Um, but I think in terms of what I've, what, what, what did reinforce for me, I think, this idea that she is very adept at playing the political game. Uh, he is very good at using the party machinery to advance his interest. And it's also, I think, maybe this is a bit less well understood, or maybe some people don't see it the same way as I did, which is I think he's quite actually quite careful in how he deploys his political capital. Um, you know, yes, he does break precedent, he does break norms, he does break rules. Uh, where he deems necessary, but I feel like he's also shown himself to be capable of exercising economy of strength. Um, you know, for example, as I cover in the book and also in my reporting for the journal, is when he uh, sort of tries to uh, consolidate his power and neutralize uh, potential threats, you know, to his personal authority, he doesn't necessarily approach people outright. So he's gone after potential ultimate centers of power, like Wang Qishan or Li Yuan Chao, or even Li Keqiang, not necessarily by going after the person himself, because that would involve expending huge amounts of political capital, potentially upending, you know, power dynamics in a party beyond the way he would uh, want it to. Uh, so he goes after these people by investigating their secretaries or, you know, investigating their former associates, things like that, where, you know, you can achieve your, the same goal with far less cost and far less disruption to the party. So I think that's, that's one thing I think maybe it, deserves a broader audience. Can I ask, just to unpack that a little bit more, maybe mm -hmm. in the general discussion, I, we can mm -hmm. bring Sheena and Neil on in this as well. Mm -hmm. Is that um, is that a, 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 a personality trait that is biased towards careful expenditure of political capital, or is that mm -hmm. um, indicate relative vulnerability to where if he directly went at political targets, the cost or the or the risk would be too high. Um, I think it's probably both. Um, but in terms of the personality side of it, I think it's a lot of it's learned behavior. Insofar as we can tell from his upbringing, you know, during the Mao era, he had you know he liked to talk about the fact that his best his, his one true education in his life is political education. Yes, he had a chemical engineering degree from Tsinghua. You know, he did go to Bai school and all that, but like. As we know, his his formal education was highly disrupted by the Cultural Revolution. So the one thing he truly learned, his true education was in politics and how the political game is played in the Communist Party. So I think he understood really well how fickle, how ephemeral one's particular uh, one's own political power can be, how fragile it is, how it can come and go very quickly, and sort of the games that you have to play is sort of uh, hiding your true intentions and how you can play people off each other. You know, that all those tactics that he saw growing up under Mao, I think that's what he internalized and has called forth when he's finally taken power himself and, you know, deploy some of those tricks and tactics in the way he governs the party. If we were comparing 11 years of the Xi administration to 
10 years of, of Hu Jintao, Wen Jiabao, and, and then the prior 1989 to 2002, three, four, Jiang Zemin, what would you say, um, again, totally different historical periods, the 1990s are very different from the 2000s, are very different from the 2010s. So to some extent, these temporal comparisons of Chinese leaders are, are hard to make because the circumstances are different. But still, if if you were um, I- expressing or explaining what you think the one or two most significant differences, either in temperament, strategy, policy agenda, risk tolerance between Xi Jinping and his two immediate predecessors, w- w- what would you say? Mm, I think maybe it was a bit, a bit technical, but I think he's a far more Leninist person or the leader in his approach to politics and governance compared to Hu Jintao and Jiang Zemin. So you might also describe it as being ideological in the sense that you know Xi demands compliance with his normative political vision uh, in the face of practical consideration. So that ultimately being read is more important than being expert, you know, delivering on the macro political vision that he has laid out is more important than finding, you know, pragmatic solutions to policy problems. So I think this, you might even attribute this in some way to their, each leader's uh, academic upbringing, their training, uh, or lack thereof uh, in terms of Xi Jinping. So, you know, both Jiang, Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao were both trained as engineers. Right, so Jiang Zemin was an electrical engineer and Hu Jintao was a hydropower engineer. Whereas Xi Jinping, yes, he studied chemical engineering, but it's not really an academic degree. As you know, mentioned in a book that one of his friends at the time described it as a degree in Marxism, you know, when he was studying in Tsinghua. So it's, it's, it's that sort of a difference in upbringing, I think, could be reflecting, could be reflected in how they approach problems. So I think Xi Jinping. When his true education is in politics, he takes a very political lens to issues. You know, he approaches governance problems, I think, it, it, politically. He sees political problems and therefore prescribes political solutions. Whereas a technocratic, someone with a technocratic background might approach the problem differently. He would see, you know, a policy problem and prescribe much more technocratic or, you know, a more pragmatic solution that's driven at solving the problem. Whereas Xi Jinping, I think his, his background is more given to diagnosing a macro political problem. And therefore, he would prescribe a political solution to, you know, these issues. And I think that's, in some ways, could go quite far in explaining, you know, the sort of approach he takes in in, uh, in his governance, where he sort of lays out a broad, you know, political vision or political guidelines as to how the problem should be solved. He doesn't necessarily prescribe down to the detail. He may not be very conversant in specific uh, matters of this policy sector. But he would set down the red lines. He would set down the, the long-term goals, and then it's sort of up to people below him to deliver. And he would uh, interfere every now and then where he sees something that doesn't quite work out the way he wants it to. But you know, he's not in the business of you know line by line, you know, drawing out policy proposals. But he he's an is is interested in setting the big picture and expecting people to uh, operate within the, the 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 boundaries that he sets. One final question dedicated to you, Chun Han, then I want to um, ask Neil and, and Sheena to come in. But um, I was actually just, as you were talking, I was thinking about the title, Party of One. Mm-hmm. And I-, I wanted to ask, how do you think, first of all, explain the title. I think, mm-hmm. uh, because I, I think the second part of this question is, of course, no dictator rules alone. Um, mm-hmm. And so I wanted to ask how you think about how and where um, we should bring in and think about advisors to Xi mm-hmm. Jinping. Uh, mm-hmm. um, tai Chi, for example, right now mm-hmm. seems to be the guy. Yeah, I feel mm-hmm. I feel bad for Ding Shuisheng, who who used to have mm-hmm. that position, and I think is now mm-hmm. sort of sitting in the corner waiting to be you know asked to dance by Xi Jinping. Um, mm-hmm. So we, you know we've known that throughout his tenure there have been a group of individuals who you know, maybe they sometimes have pole position, maybe they move back, but they're still in the orbit, right? We think of, mm-hmm. um, um, you know, we think of Wang Huning comes to mind, right, with with a lot of this mm-hmm. stuff, as a Ding Shui Shang. Um, mm-hmm. Han Zheng, it, it, you know, for a vice president, seems to be doing more, you know, going to Unga. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. We're seeing the office of the premier now go through this mm-hmm. kind of odd re-empowerment maybe or mm-hmm. simply mm-hmm. a matter of of Li Chang being mm-hmm. closely uh trusted 
Uh, Wang mm-hmm. Qishan, early on in the Xi administration, played a very important role in anti-corruption. So if you were kind of writing a book about Xi Jinping's advisors, mm-hmm. um, who would be in the who would be in the the table of contents for playing mm-hmm. key roles? And mm-hmm. and second is how important are they to policy, you know, formulation and implementation? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So the first question, the title of the book, actually this, I think I've told some people this story, but the title Party of One was originally the title of the chapter on succession, uh, as you can see why, you know, like basically he's remade the party around himself and he is like a one man walking key person risk, you know, you know, it's corporate term, but this guy represents key person risk on a global scale, being the leader of the world's second largest economy and one of the most consequential nations on earth. So that was originally my idea for the title of the succession chapter. But then my agent suggested to me, the moment he saw my proposal, like that should be the title of the book. And I was like, yes, actually that makes a lot of sense because it goes beyond succession, right? It, go, it, it speaks to how he has made himself the center of political and public life in China. Everything has his name on it, all major policies, um, you couldn't go to any shopping mall now and not see some digital, you know, screen that puts his face on every now and then. Like his his slogans with his name are like, especially in Beijing, at least when I was there, uh, you, you see his face and name in all sorts of places. That that that's something that not that it never happened before, but it definitely became very clear, you know, as she grew more powerful into his reign. So I think the title essentially is a very succinct way to describe this change, both the, the optics of it and also the practical elements of it, which is Xi Jinping has, in a sense, in essence, put himself at the center of uh, political and public life in China. And three words to for a book title, I think is very easy to convey that idea. Um, in terms of advisors, I think um, they are advisors and they're advisors, right? They, they are, like you mentioned Tai Chi. I, I was discussing with this with someone recently that no, Tai Chi is really important. Obviously, he is the director of the uh, general office of the Central Committee. It's a highly important job. He's the nerve center of the party. But at the same time, I don't think he holds that role in, 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 and, and act, uh, as seen as a as type of aid that, say, Ding Xuexiang was and Li Zhangshu was. You know, these two people being the previous upholders of that office. You know, Li Zhangshu was a far more, far more like a peer to Xi Jinping. You know, they were county chiefs together in counties that were Actually, side by side back in the 80s, right? And Ding Xuexiang, I think, have worked more closely in some, in some degrees uh, with Xi Jinping, um, especially when they were in Shanghai. And then he sort of, that relationship carried on through in the, the, the early years of Xi Jinping's rule as, as general secretary. But I think Tsai Chi, well, first of all, the fact that he's a standing committee member, I, remember, uh, I have a friend who made the joke that. Uh, essentially, Xi Jinping has grown s- so much in his uh, sense of imperial self-importance that only a standing committee member is fit to run the general office, you know, uh, uh, of today. So, like, it's, so in some ways, I think it reflects that. But at the same time, the relationship between him and Xi Jinping, I don't think it's the same as Li Zhangshu, the one that Li Zhangshu had, for example. The Tai Chi is my understanding. I mean, this is sort of based on a bit of, like, gossip, you know, the grapevine, which... It's, it's hard to really verify, but the idea that is that he seems to be more of like a implementer, like he's the aide, he is the guy who's told to do certain things and he tries to get it done, rather than someone who actually brings ideas to the leader. Whereas I think that role is perhaps more fulfilled by someone like Wang Kunin or, or even someone like Li Chang. So our understanding of Li Chang's relationship with Xi Jinping is, you know, it's a very interesting one. The secretary or the Mishu, you know, with the officials that, that he serves, like that relationship is very symbiotic. It's sort of a very implicit trust that's built up over years of working together. Um, the Mishu is very good at defining the, the boss's will and trying to sort of translate it into actionable directives. Like that, that, that relationship, I think you're far more able to articulate what the leader wants. You're able to guess what he wants. And also you... I have a certain way of communicating with a leader that you wouldn't have if you're just someone who's seen as like a more of like a executor and enforcer. So I think within the standing committee, within the public bureau, uh, this is hard to figure out precisely because of how, you know, the nature of black box politics is very hard to know the individual dynamics of people's relationships. But insofar as we can discern them, I think we, is, is some of it is, is clear to us that 
the relationship that Xi Jinping has with each individual Politburo member or standing committee member is different. It has changed over time, or like when people have, you know, pe different people occupy the same office, we can see that I think the relationship between them is different, which means he may have a different perspective of how this particular office should function. Um, but I think that the, in terms of who should be in that contents page of advisors that matter, I think it's not a secret. I think a lot of them we've already talked about. A lot of people have talked about them before. So you're talking about people like Wang Kuning, you're talking about people like um, Li Chang, maybe potentially someone like Chen Min Er, but I'm not sure. His star seems to have faded since people talked him up when he was Chongqing Party Secretary. But as you say, you know, things th these things come and go. You know, we we're never really sure how these interpersonal relationships might evolve. But I think you, you shouldn't have to look too far beyond the existing product bureau to have a sense. And also, actually, the central part, uh, the central policy research office. You know, think uh, Wang Kuning's successor there. I think is also someone to watch. Uh, he has been uh, quite a vocal, you know, person in terms of articulating what the leader wants. So I think these are the key characters we have to look for. Sheena, Neil, I want, I'd like to bring you in. So I guess Sheena first for you, then then Neil. Just first of all, um, uh, um, feel free to ask Chunhan any questions that um, I didn't ask uh, or failed to ask or didn't ask or, um, cl clearly enough or concisely enough. Second, just general impressions on um, the the book um, or anything Chunhan has has just said on any of the questions I asked. Um, Sheena, over to you. Yeah, well, first, congratulations, Junhan. This is a, a terrific book. I really enjoyed Thank reading you. it, even having, you know, read your reporting for a long time. There was a lot that you stitched together here and contextualize and, and sort of present um, that's really an interesting portrait of Xi Jinping and of China under Xi Jinping. So, so many congrats on that. Um, I have about four things that jumped out at me when I was reading the book, the last of which is a question that follows up on, on um, some of what Jude has already said. Um, you know, first, it, just starting with the, the book title, right, I, I think your book really draws out, um, at least in the world that I come from, which is academic political science, we tend to think of authoritarian regimes as either party-led or personalist, or we have for a long time. And I think what you do is, is show us what the fusion of those two looks like. Right when you have a very uh, sort of a strong personal leader atop a party system who really tries to take over, remake the party for his personal vision of governance, and that's um, that's something that I think the book draws out in a really interesting way, um, and it's something that that we do, I think you know at least in the academic field that I sit in is is a little bit challenging to our usual you know the sort of category boxes we like to separate things into. Um, but second, then, and, and you use this phrase once already this morning, um, you know, the challenge that that creates for succession in China's political system is is immense. And you use this phrase this morning, and it's in, I think, maybe the one of the early chapters of the book, key person risk, right? Mm -hmm. That if Xi Jinping really is looking out for long, the longevity of party rule, he's actually created a significant point of failure risk here for the, the party. Um, and I just thought that was a fascinating point that you made in a way that I, I haven't heard a lot of other people make. And so I don't know if we want to double back and talk about, about mm -hmm. succession a little bit more, but the part about the rise of Xi Jinping and then the implications of what the next transfer to the next leader might look like, I thought were, were really well done. Um, the, the third point that I thought that you, you drew out really in a really interesting way that I, it just was really struck by, um, even though this is an area that I've follow pretty closely was a discussion about Xi Jinping's use of law, right? Mm -hmm. And I remember reading Han Fei in grad school when I was writing my dissertation, which was more about Taiwan than mainland China, but um, the sort of legalist framework that he uses and just the pace with which you call him the codifier in chief, which I thought was a really mm -hmm. nice phrase because mm -hmm. he has passed an immense number of national security laws. Um, which is the area I follow, but it's you do a really nice job of pointing out that he's also do, the NPC under Xi Jinping has just passed a lot more laws in general, right? And so this legalization and the use of um, of law as a tool of party governance, I thought was was really um, uh, was a really helpful part of the the book. Um, and then the the fourth one, which is really my the question I, I want maybe wanted to throw out because I do think it gets to this puzzle of how strong is Xi Jinping really, right? How 
Um, and what does it mean to be strong in a system like the one he's created? I'm, I, I, there are multiple threats that any leader has to contend with in different political systems. And as the, the institutional design of the system changes, so does the risk to the person at the top. Um, but I was really interested, you know, you go through in the book kind of the fact that Xi Jinping purged a significant number of, of leaders in the coercive apparatus in the military. Um, he cut the, the PLA significantly. I think only maybe Mao and, and Deng Xiaoping have reduced the size of the military as much as Xi Jinping um, did. Um, and these are things that typically could be seen as, and the anti-corruption purges were kind of a, a maybe a little bit of a pushback on the military's, the PLA's traditional autonomy. Um, not that he's taken away that autonomy. I'm definitely not saying that, right? The PLA retains some significant organizational um, autonomy. But Xi Jinping has done some things that traditionally in a lot of other non-democratic political systems would maybe raise the risk of the military acting against him, um, aligning with another leader or just doing something to, to challenge him. Um, and so I actually think, but on the other hand, Leninist systems, you talked about Xi Jinping is sort of the ultimate Leninist, mm -hmm. right? Leninist systems tend to have very low rates of military coups. Um, or attempted military takeover. Um, mm -hmm. And so I just, I find, I, and I wanted to ask you kind of how you put all these pieces together. Because when mm -hmm. I look at, at Xi Jinping's China, one of the, the biggest um, puzzles for me that bears directly on this question of, I think, of how strong or weak he is, and also has mm -hmm. lots of implications for things like a Taiwan scenario, um, mm -hmm. are what is his relationship with the military? How mm -hmm. comfortable with his level of command, the quality of the information he gets um, from the military, and how how do we think that relationship functions, and what is his perception of it? Um, mm -hmm. What's the military's perception of it? Um, mm -hmm. I, I just, I you know, um, you bring a lot of really interesting details out in the book, but I I, I confess I remain puzzled by mm -hmm. um, what this relationship is, and I think it's it's hugely consequential for Chinese politics. Traditionally, has mm -hmm. been in Chinese history, which you you point out. So that's my sort of like question I wanted to toss back, which is, what mm -hmm. do you make of his evolving relationship with the the military, and how that matters inside the political system you describe? Mm -hmm. So I'll I'll stop there. But those are things that that jumped out at me, and one potential question for you, um, mm -hmm. and then. Jude, I'm happy to follow up, but I, I want to stop there. Great. Ch Chunan, do you want to um, offer some thoughts so, on, on that question? Sure. I mean, uh, I like to think about Xi Jinping's power in two terms. Like, one is like, how does he, where is relative standing to other people in the party, like to, to other, his peers, his fellow leaders? And I think in, on that front, he's unquestionably, you know, powerful. There's no clear rival, there's no clear alternate power center, there's no doubt that he is numero uno. Uh, the other terms which we can look at power is what can he get done? And I think the record, the record there is far more mixed. Um, you don't have to look too far in terms of what he has failed to deliver. Uh, I, the example I use in the book, for example, is uh, retirement age. In, I was at the very, very press conference in 2015 where the labor minister at the time promised to raise the retirement age. You know, at least they, by 2017, there will be a roadmap. They will roll out some plan that explains which options they've chosen and the timeline for implementing. And we're now into almost the end of 2023 and we've seen nothing on uh, any any meaningful progress on that front. So I think in terms of you have all this power, but your ability to deploy it uh, doesn't necessarily translate, right? You, you, are, you are still constrained by practicalities of, you know, the bureaucracy, the difficulties, the challenges you're trying to take on. Um, so I think it, it is useful to try to use these this framework to understand when we say how powerful Xi Jinping is, you know, we, we want to be able to measure in some way. So if you measure in terms of, is he, you know, in charge? Is he, is there anyone who can challenge his power in the party? I think it's no. So in that sense, very powerful, but in terms of as you can ability to implement that authority and use it in a meaningful way, maybe not so much. Um, moving on to the, the military piece of it, I think it's mean, we talked about the, the purges, right? So I think what, what Xi Jinping clearly has done quite well is that, yes, you destroy a lot of people's uh, careers, you upset a lot of vested interests in the military. But at the same time, I think at the same, you have to empower a certain other faction in the military. They're always winners and losers in purges. So clearly has identified the winners of the purges and allied with them in a way that, you know, it has only consolidated his own position and his own influence over the military. So I think 
the the key beneficiaries are people who actually believe in having a modern, modernized, capable fighting force. The people who actually are, you know, professional soldiers and take pride in having command of a military that can go toe to toe with the West, you know, go against up against America, against European powers, and be able to, you know, deploy a vast weaponry, engage in combined arms operations and things like that. People who actually want to see, you know, a, a PLA worthy of the name. And I think Xi Jinping has, you know, done a good job in sort of making sure these people are empowered. Uh, obviously, recent events suggest that there are still some big problems in the military that he has yet to resolve fully. But I think in terms of understanding how he has made, like, asserted his control over the military, I think he's basically identified who wants to be rid of and found the right people to team up with and who accept his authority. And, and he has in turn empowered these people to rise up in the system and take senior senior positions in the PLA. Neil, let me bring you in. <clears throat> same same set of questions to Sheena, but just general thoughts and impression uh, on the books. Any thoughts on comments made where you'd like to add uh, or fill in gaps or challenge any of the, the comments made? And then, and then if you had any uh, questions for, for Chunhan emerging from the book, we'd welcome you raised those as well. Thanks, Jude. Uh, yeah, I'll just join the chorus of praise for Chunhan's book. I think it's um, Thank you. the best overview of Chinese politics in the Xi era. And anyone who hasn't read it should uh, go out and grab a copy and you know use it to fill people's stockings at Christmas or uh, whatever you celebrate coming up. Um, so I think it's a, it's a great book. Uh, thank you for writing it, Chunhan. In terms of two highlights for me, in terms of um, the book's contents, I mean, it's all good, but uh, I think it's the, the past and the future of Xi's uh, role in Chinese politics, I think uh, done especially well, like telling that story of Xi's rise to power. I think, and you obviously, you know, draw together different sources, but I think it's the best kind of condensation of that journey from, you know, Xi's childhood to Xi being, uh, you know, on the throne of Chinese politics and just kind of highlighting the role of, you know, Xi's skill as a political operator and how he would, you know, cultivate uh, senior leaders at the time, like the importance of Jiang Zemin and especially um, Jia Qinglin in Xi's rise um, and, you know, how he, he played the game. And I mean, you use a quote from Robert Caro, the biographer of uh, LBJ here in the US that, you know, uh, when you're rising through the ranks, you conceal, uh, but when you have power that reveals and I think that that's kind of uh, really useful in thinking about how people got Xi Jinping so wrong, right? And uh, you know, he he was playing a game, right? He wasn't putting his cards on the table. He wasn't, um, you know, really aligning himself strongly with either particular camps. He was obviously cultivating Jiang, but like he wasn't, you know, ever seen as Jiang's top lieutenant or anything like that at the time. Um, and I think that holds some lessons for us in thinking about you know, what's next in, in Chinese politics? Like, it's uh, may well be the case that we've got, you know, I think it is the case, we have no idea who is, uh, you know, next and who might be coming. But in terms of even how we think about that conversation, um, we do really have to remember how little we know, uh, especially about these, you know, interpersonal relationships between the top leaders. Like, you know, we you know, kind of know that Li Chang's kind of taking a lead role in the economy. You know, Tsai Chi's obviously doing a lot of things behind the scenes. Um, but, in terms of you know who others would rally behind, uh, or who might you know have a a ruthless political uh, skill set that they haven't shown to us yet, you know we really we know very little about about those things. Um, I think that's you know kind of leads me to the other highlight, which is the discussion of succession. And you know, see Jude and Richard wrote a great uh, Richard McGregor wrote a great paper about that as well. So these are kind of the two um, best things written about this question. Um, and I think that I mean Chun Han arrives at a uh, conclusion that maybe, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Chunhan, but my impression is that you think it maybe is more likely than not that she will at some point, you know, name a successor and try and, you know, put his political capital behind a, a succession plan. Um, that's obviously not happening in the near future in, uh, in your telling, um, but I think that is, you know, that's a source of um, uncertainty, but also potentially, you know, debate and disagreement. Like I, I potentially think that she is a little bit, uh, all the reason why he hasn't chosen a successor so far, um, the fact that you create potentially like a, a rival, you have a lame duck situation where your power might start to drain away, you don't have necessarily guarantees about how that success is going to deal with you and your family, 
are kind of sources, ingredients for indecision um, mm -hmm. in politics. And we may kind of get a situation where it's not necessarily a strong succession, it's more like a kind of Mao and, uh, you know, Kwa Gua Feng type situation where she kind of sees the writing on the wall for himself a bit too late and there's only a very weak successor without as much planning. Uh, but I think, you know, I don't know, like that's, uh, I think that you make a pretty good case that, uh, you know, made me certainly think about, uh, it was more likely than I'd previously thought that uh, she could get behind that sort of a plan. Um, so that's, you know, maybe something we can talk about later in terms of two kind of uh, questions that kind of um, the book made me think of, I and mean, there's a lot in, in a very good way, right, in terms of stimulating discussion and debate about Chinese politics. Um, I think uh, for me, I'm, there's two things I'd be really curious to get your further thoughts on um, is, I mean, firstly, uh, I think the role of ideology. I mean, that's something that we talk about a lot with Xi. It's, you know, kind of a, a theme that goes across a lot of chapters in the book. And, you know, there's these statistics like, you know, local government officials saying they're spending 30 to 40 percent of their time or, or you know, SOE employees too on ideological training um, and on, on one sense it's you know it's obvious, it seems ridiculous and it's you know a waste of time but I guess I wonder if you could share some more thoughts on like why do you think she is doing this and is it is there a case that it is beneficial for policy making and, and implementation in the the party and kind of the way that you know uh, a multinational firm might kind of invest in this whole, you know, corporate values type campaign that they think will, um, you know, help them to, you know, get more work out of their employees. Um, and curious on your thoughts on that. And then secondly, um, we talk a lot about the mistakes that she's made, or in our view, what are mistakes that she has made. Um, and I think it's clear he's made quite a few um, in terms of, you know, China's foreign policy and China's economy. But I'm curious as to if, you know, if Xi Jinping was made to go through one of his own performance evaluations, kind of account for his performance to the party, what are kind of the three biggest successes you think he would discuss and are those actually successes? So those are just a couple of things that I would love to hear, you know, more from you on that hopefully are interesting mm -hmm. to, uh, mm -hmm. to everyone watching. I, but, you know, before you get to that, Sheena, I know... I had missed a, a ping from you that you wanted to come in on the back of a previous topic. So maybe before we um, go into ideology and self-assessments, let me just turn it over to you, Sheena, for, for a second to close off that thread. Yeah, sure. Um, so first, I forgot to say this earlier, but um, everything I'm saying today are my individual views, not the views of the U.S. Army, the Army War Too College, late. Department of Defense. <laughs> uh, forgot, I got to get that out of the way. Um, with that done, um, thank you. Um, so, so my only point was just as a, a follow-up to some of what um, Chunhan was saying and, and Jude, the question you raised, right? Um, how powerful Xi Jinping is, is not the same as asking how secure his hold on power is. And I think, right, if we take Xi Jinping at his word, he actually in some ways sees China's power and China's security as inversely correlated, right? The more powerful China gets, the bigger the risks and the dangers are. Um, mm -hmm. It's this very dialectical thinking about opportunity and, and power and risk. Um, and so I just wanted to, to point out that, um, you know, if if we're having a conversation about how powerful he is and we assume that translates into a perception on his part of security, we may uh, have trouble understanding some of his ongoing behavior. Um, and to me, I think it's really, really important when trying to explain Xi Jinping to delink those two and, and remember that they might be positively correlated, but they might actually be inversely correlated. And mm -hmm. it seems context dependent. Um, so Chunhan, I'd, I'd welcome you to push back on that or, or Jude or, or Neil, um, but I just, I wanted to throw that out there because I think some of Xi Jinping's statements about China's, the relationship between power and security for China um, are, are fascinating, counterintuitive, but fairly plain in the way he stated them. And if you if you apply that to, and maybe we shouldn't, right? Maybe we shouldn't personalize this to Xi Jinping's hold on power. But but um, but I think it at least opens up a question that we we should not assume or take for for granted. So that was my only only thought. But I think it does bear on and one of the framing questions of the book and of this discussion. So I wanted to put that out there. Thanks, Jude, for for your patience and letting me loop back and close that circle. It's it's a no because it's a great it's a great point. Um, you know, she has said on a several occasions, forget the exact wording, um, 
but something to the effect of the closer we get to rejuvenation, the harder it's going to become. I think some of that is preparing the system, but I think it's also a diagnosis. I, I've always said something to the effect of, you know, Xi Jinping is in power, but he's not necessarily in control. Um, just to distinguish Chun Han's comment of, you know, formal accumulation of political power, but then your ability to implement a policy agenda is a is a slightly different thing. But maybe we could just go, I think it's a it's a really important framework comment from Sheena and Neil and Chun Han. Let me get your assessment of it as well, because it does seem a structural feature of dictatorship. And actually, I was just watching on Netflix as as they try to fill the endless content machine with um, uh, new documentaries. There's one on John Gotti. And the, the further up the ranks you move of the mafia, you're, you're more powerful. But I think you feel you feel more vulnerable, right? Because folks are gunning for you. I would imagine it's just a, a, a feature um, of autocratic systems. But Sheena, you do this more formally than I do. That that um, you, the more powerful you become, you, you you don't you don't feel more secure in that. In fact, I think you're aware of how many potential rivals and enemies you've either created or are, or are right right behind you. I think there's the retirement question of. You know, it's hard once you've once you've climbed over enough bodies to get to a position in power. What's your what's the re retirement plan you have where you feel like you have any security? And once you leave the throne, um, then you're a little bit at the the whims and wills of of whoever assumes it. So, you know, Chunan, let's go with you, and then and then Neil. How do you think at a framework level about? That, that sort of dichotomy between power um, and security, do you see it as um, Sheena has laid it out um, or also as Xi Jinping has laid it out of the closer, you know, the more we stick our head up um, and our strength and our power becomes known, the more the United States, you know, and its, its allies is going to be gunning for us. I think it makes a lot of sense. I mean, I, mean, I remember this conversation that, you know, Drew, we had, many years ago back in Beijing, but we were both still there, was that maybe we should start thinking in terms of analyzing Xi Jinping in, in comparison with Stalin. You know, like there's no doubt Stalin was the most powerful man in the Soviet Union, but he was he was also well, probably the most paranoid man in the Soviet Union. You know, like he, he saw enemies everywhere. You know, the fact that you're more powerful, you have more to lose, you perceive more enemies, you have made more enemies. Um, there's just so much more at stake, you know, given where your higher standing within the system uh, I think the same if you apply it at the national level, you know, the more interest that China has, the more vulnerabilities you have, the more things you have to defend, the more, like, it's sort of the burden of knowing more, and in some ways as well, like, the, the burden of knowledge, like, you realize where you're ignorant, so the more powerful you have to realize where you're weak, so I think that's this sort of oxymoronic, like, sort of self-fulfilling thing, where, like, you, you, the more powerful you are, in some ways, you, you feel where you're, you, you are, you're more keenly aware of where you're vulnerable. So I think this applies both at the personal level and both at the state level. So I don't think it's it's contradictory. I think Sheena makes a very good point about this. And it's definitely something we should think about, you know, when we try to understand why, you know, for, for a country that professes to be, you know, almost on the cusp of success and rejuvenation, why does it still see so many problems? I think it's because, like you said, it's because it's almost there. Therefore, the, the stakes are higher, the risk is greater, and the cause of failure is even more, you know, uh, dramatic. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure if Neil has anything to add on, on this on this point. Yeah, I guess just quickly, I think you know, she is smart to realize that, right? Like, I mean, yes, obviously things that he has done have contributed to this US-China dynamic, but um, yeah, there's a case to make that there'd be more friction between the two countries, you know, even if, you know, Li Keqiang had been general secretary for the last uh, 10 years. Um, and so, you know, doing things like reorienting China's foreign policy towards the global south, trying to build up domestic bases for innovation and high technology, they're, they're big gambles. But I mean, if they end up working, she's going to seem like one of the, the smartest statesmen uh, in the world. Uh, it's a different question as to how likely they are to work. But in terms of diagnosing the issues that China is currently facing, like there's you know, there's other ways you could go about doing it, but it's not, uh, you know, irrational to um, kind of be pursuing the policies he is. And then on a personal level, uh, in elite politics, I mean, 
Yes, uh, Stalin was very paranoid, but he did, you know, he ruled the Soviet Union for his entire, you know, the rest of his life. And I think that the similar kind of calculation applies to to Xi from the you know brutal perspective of just, you know, commanding elite politics. Like it's not a weakness to be identifying these problems. It's actually a strength. It's kind of it's vigilance um, uh, in some ways, just as much as it is as it is insecurity, because that's just the game you're in. If you're a kind of authoritarian leader, um, you're not winning elections, you're trying to keep your hold on a few instruments of uh, state power, and that's what matters. We've only got about 14 minutes left, so I might, <clears throat> I had sent through some questions. I might cut <clears throat> a good number of those because I think realistically we've got, uh, um, we've got time for maybe two questions. So let me start with one, and Sheena, let me start with you. Um, the... I think certainly since COVID and the zero COVID policy and the sudden dramatic turnaround of it, but also as we've seen um, external behavior from China, you know, sort of wolf warriorism that in, in many ways works against China's own interests or the passing of the national security law while Taiwan, you know, in Hong Kong, while Taiwan was was going through an election, which resulted in, you know, the polls shifting in favor of of. Tsai Ing-wen, you know, you could go down the list where um, I think there has been this a diagnosis that the one of the reasons we're seeing poor outcomes of the Chinese system or the Xi administration is this information challenge. You know, you hear this in various versions. This comes up in a lot of discussions of, you know, concerns about maybe an invasion of Taiwan, where even if we think he's rational, as we've seen in the case of Vladimir Putin, making a risky um, uh, invasion of Ukraine, you know, are these autocrats getting the quote right information? Um, so I wanted to ask you a, a, a two-parter and then I'll, I wanted to go to Chunhan and Neil as well. I mean, first of all, you study autocratic systems writ large. So I wanted to ask you just a general framing question of how should we think about information flows and decision-making? Is this a bug or a feature of um, these types of regimes that information flows are highly distorted. And then as a second question, just if you could apply this to your own assessment of the Xi administration and Xi Jinping as well, do you see the, the some of the puzzling outcomes that seem to work against China's own interest as being the product of bad information? And then if, I think by inverse, if, if Xi Jinping had quote unquote good information we would see better outcomes or, or do you see something else? Yeah, I think those are a set of, of great and really complicated questions um, that are very difficult to assess in a system that is as opaque at the elite levels as China has become under Xi Jinping. So let me just caveat everything I'm about to say with the appropriate dose of, of intellectual humility here. Um, in general, information problems are a feature, not a bug, of non-democratic political systems. Um, leaders tend to set up systems where they hire people who don't like to give them bad news, either because there's a they hire them based on loyalty or because they punish people who do bring them bad news. Saddam Hussein was famous for having, you know, chopped up, I think it was the health minister, and delivered him back to his family in a box. Right? Um, not surprisingly, no one wanted to tell him the truth about the performance of, or ability to perform of his own military after that. Um, that's not so much. I, I, so I think there are some some features of that that we might be seeing in, in China. But authoritarian political systems vary in how much they have information problems and where the information problems come from. Right in China, it's pretty. It's been a pretty long-standing feature of Chinese politics that the center sometimes has trouble monitoring and enforcing local officials. And this is something that, that I think comes out in, um, in Party of One um, in really interesting ways. The attempt of central officials to strengthen their control over the lower levels of, of bureaucracy um, is, is a really interesting thread that goes through it and, and shows up in a number of, of places in the, the book. Um, and I, I think that discussion is fascinating. Um, so that's the typically the sort of the traditional information problem that we we see in in China's political system. Xi Jinping and the party are clearly aware of this, right? This is not this is not like they've never heard that they have a problem getting information from this massive system that they sit at the top of, right? And one of the things Xi Jinping did in 2015 
fairly early on when he was trying to figure out how to get control over Chinese society and the party state system was to talk about there's a state council directive that uses this phrase information based multidimensional information based system of prevention and control part of which is the surveillance state but even around you know three four years later um I think it was Li Keqiang talked about how the party still had these problems of information islands, that information being collected in one system or one locality wasn't getting integrated with the rest of the information the party had, which made it very hard to use all of the information that they were collecting to actually govern. Right? And so that's a separate information problem. You, you know, the inform you, you might, somebody in the system might have the information. It's getting it to the person who actually needs it in a form they can use with all the other information that, put, that, that needs to be weighted in making a policy decision, right? And so I think that that, just by nature of the, the Chinese political system, there are structural informational problems. People like Jeremy Wallace, Jennifer Pan um, have, have done some, some really interesting, um, you know, research on, on in information flows um, in, within the, the Chinese political system. Um, but I think it's actually hard to tell how much of what we're seeing in some of these decisions is a feature of flawed information versus other features of the, the Chinese political system. Um, so I'll keep it short, but, but just take the defense minister as an example, right? The defense minister was recently removed. There's sort of two stories I think about, about what plausibly could have happened there. And I am just wildly speculating here um, because I, I don't, Think we know and maybe we'll find out at some point and um uh maybe chin hunter's colleagues can can tell us more at, at some point um but um it, either it so the decision to appoint lee reportedly came from from xi jinping um which suggests that either he didn't have all the information about the potential corruption that we think then led to lee's removal or he had the information wanted to appoint Li, and remember that was actually a potentially a costly decision by Xi Jinping because Li was sanctioned by the United States government. And so that was going to propose, uh, present some problem for um, defense, the defense relationship with the, the United States, which is not exactly going swimmingly um, and smoothly these days. So, um, you know, it, either he had the, he, he didn't have the information which suggests the informational problem, Jude, that you raised. Or I think the other hypothesis is that he had it, didn't think it mattered all that much, or thought that he could manage it, then realized that there was some cost that maybe we're not even seeing that led him to reverse course. And, and that's more an issue of the the power that, that Chun Han is talking about, the, the power to make these very senior personnel decisions and then reverse them very quickly using the party as, a, as the lever or the mechanism of power. Um, one is an informational story. One is a story about concentration of power, that kind of key person risk, which isn't just a succession issue. It's also about the key person risk that comes with one person not having checks and balances on the quality of, of their decision making. And frankly, no person uh, makes perfect decisions. Right. Um, that is that is typically, you know, in a democracy that's like the United States. That's part of why there's this checks and balances idea between the different branches of government. Other democracies do it differently. But that idea that you need to limit the, the flawed decision making of one individual is sort of hard baked into certain political systems. It's not in a personalist one. And so I think it's hard to tell what we're seeing. Um, you know, as an informational problem versus a problem of personalization. They're related, but they're not quite the same. Um, and that does affect potentially things like Taiwan and how much confidence Xi Jinping has in the assessments he's getting from his military. How he'll react if he doesn't trust an assessment is probably a longer conversation. But I think, again, we need to think carefully about what the possibilities are if that is, in fact, the case. Um, and we see the same kind of thing in control over the uniformed military, um, which we, we may or may not see. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, Jude, but I feel like I've talked too long already, so I'll stop there. <laughs> no, that was great. Thank you. Um, Chunhan and, and Neil, just can I get your, your quick um, reactions, reflections on the information question? And I think we'll have time for one quick round robin of, of final thoughts. So Chunhan, let me go to you first. How do you think about the information question? I think Xi Jinping is very aware of this issue. I mean, I think it was last year or two years ago where he talked about this issue where he I basically appealed to officials like go out and make friends in the grassroots so you can have a perception of like reality on the ground. You better improve your understanding of what's happening. 
on the front lines in the cold face. It's a bit rich coming from him, perhaps, but like the fact that he made this a very public appeal, I think he understands the basic nature of the problem. And I'm sure he understands that th that also applies to himself. Um, this applies, I mean, I've heard anecdotes, um, not just him, but other officials have done this as well. Like for example, Wang Tishan, where you, you would also use informal channels. You get your old buddies, you know, your old war comrades, you know, back in the day where you had like, for example, Wang Tishan, used to call upon people he knew when he was more you know at the rural affairs office back in the 80s like get those people to help him run some private like under this fly you know sort of uh inspections or like you know sort of fact finding missions and then report back to him so he has a better sense of what's actually happening on the ground my understanding that xi jinping also talks to people whether it's like family members or you know he, he in the past not so sure what he does as much of it now was like he actually would talk to fellow Prince Links, I think, to just at least get a sense of different reporting channels. Apart from the formal party reporting channels, he has other sources of information. Obviously, the quality of that is also questionable, even if we don't really know. And how he applies that, what he does with that information, we also don't really know. But I think he has demonstrated awareness of the problem. Uh, I'm just not sure we have, know enough, you know, we have enough facts on our hands to, dis to have a good assessment of whether he has come up with a reasonable solution. Neil? Yeah, I'll just add super quickly another thing that, you know, is in Chunhan's book and has been um, you know, discussed elsewhere as well is the um, introduction of these kind of public mailboxes on official websites. Uh, so I think Chunhan discusses the one on the CCDI website after Wang Qishan kind of took over in the early Xi era. And, you know, this allows, you know, anyone, uh, as long as you, you know, don't put in stuff that's too critical of Xi or people who are affiliated with him to, you know, sh you know, basically uh, to report on local officials who are doing things they don't like. And there's, you know, there's actually dozens and dozens of these mailboxes on different websites. It's kind of like the online version of petitioning or kind of the letters and calls system. So it's kind of another way in which you know, she has at least attempted to try and uh, you know, increase the, the things in his toolkit to address this information problem. We have two minutes left, so I'm going to take a question that I had flagged I was going to ask, but I'm going to modify it slightly. It's going to be slightly harder, but um, I think all everyone on joining it, the four, three of you have, we're all sort of some variation of Xi Jinping is firmly in power. Let me ask, the what is the specific thing or the sort of thing you would see emerge in open source that would begin to ch change your mind about in a, in a fundamental way on Xi Jinping's grip on power. It doesn't have to be the specific thing because I know we, we don't know, but either give me the specific thing you would see or an indicative sort of thing where you would watch that and say, oh, okay, something's changing here. Chunhan, you wrote the book, so unfortunately you get, you have to go first. Um, okay. What what would it be? Uh, I would think in the current context, it would be the emergence or re-emergence of discordant voices on key policy matters or principle, political principles in open source material. So whether it's like state media or like party journals, where, you know, this was common in the past. You know, you tend to see different, very vigorous debates on key issues in these platforms. But I think Xi Jinping has largely quashed it. You know, it's pretty much speaking with one voice now. But the fact that if, you know, we start to see signs of this re-emerging, more vigorous debates on actually very fundamental issues, I think it's a sign that the perceived risk of speaking against the leader has declined or they are not so fearful anymore or they think the stakes are so high that the, the leader is making so many bad mistakes, we have to speak up or risk the whole edifice collapsing. So I think and, the re-emergence what, of... Can I ask you, what would be the issue... Yeah. What would be the, the specific topic amongst that blanket statement where you would go, oh my gosh? Oh, uh, that's a bit tough. I think I guess it would be things like, you know, fundamental- like Taiwan? One, yeah, it could be Taiwan, it could be something fundamental like a term limits, you know, something in terms okay. of like political reforms, things that okay. clearly are added, uh, unequivocally linked to Xi Jinping and he personally changed. And okay. if you reverse that, yeah, then we, I think it's a very clear sign. Okay, Neil. Um, I agree with Chunhan. That would be a, a really big thing to watch. Another thing to watch would be personnel. I mean, the Chinese system is really important to have your people controlling the, you know, important levers of power. So, I mean, if we started seeing, you know, people who were affiliated with, you know, more affiliated with, you know, Jiang Zemin or Tuan Pai or 
just totally non she people getting promoted into important positions. Um, that would be you know, over you know she allies. That would be a, an important signal and one you expect to to happen at the next party congress um, in a major way. If there was some major change in the you know orientation of power in Beijing, um, similarly, if you started seeing like a, a lot more um, focus in party media on different types of people and less focus on Xi himself, and um, whether that's you know Xi being replaced by one of his allies, like suddenly Li Qiang or you know, someone else is, you know, the really center of attention, um, but maybe it's someone different, maybe it's the, someone in the military. Um, that would also, whatever it is, be a, a signal. And, and Neil, that would, you would not interpret that of a sign of compromise and moderation. You would interpret that as a sign of losing grip? Well, she has to compromise more. He's losing some of his grip on power, right? Okay. Um, okay. The degree of what that, that, that happened would, you know, kind of land you on whether this is, you know, a slight compromise given, you know, a, a falling economy or whether this is like a major change in, you know, who's actually running the show. Sheena. A health issue. Given Xi Jinping's <laughs> age, um, I think that that's something we should be looking for. Um, a health issue that cannot be, you know, sort of concealed or managed privately uh, has lots of political implications. That's what forced succession planning in North Korea, pretty clearly, um, from Kim Jong-il to Kim Jong-un. Um, and I think it would have the same effect here. If we saw Xi Jinping swimming in the Yangtze River um, <laughs> with, with that. Um, and so can I ask just very quickly on the Li Keqiang death, do you think, given he was 68, looked good as of his last public appearance, do you, do you think that has any knock-on effects? Does that raise uncomfortable questions? Um, what I think do you it think? raises questions, but, but uh, questions that are already there uh, okay. because Xi Jinping is so central to the system and it's unclear how it would function if anyone else tried to take his place. Um, well, I sorry to have rushed <coughs> rushed the final few questions, um, but as someone said before we started recording uh, the hour, it will go by fast, and it did, and I only got to about 14% of the questions uh, I had uh, prepared. So first of all, um, just another huge congratulations to uh, Chun Han um, for writing this, this great book, which is going to persist and last. Um, you know, this is this is a book that explains the last decade and gives us a good uh, firm stance to look forward uh, another 10 years with the appropriate caveat that Sheena made about intellectual humility. Um, nonetheless, I think this is going to be a really lasting book. And then a, a really hearty thanks to uh, comrade Sheena Greitens and, and Neil Thomas for joining us on a Monday morning um, when there's a lot else going on. Finally, uh, thanks to the entire team at CSIS who, who does everything to make this look easy um, and, and seamless. So hope everyone is off to a, a good start of their week. Appreciate everyone's um, uh, tuning in and um, uh, hope to see all you in, in person in the near future. So thank you.